The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Alliance Australia Life Insurance Limited, ABN 27076 033 782, AFSL 296 559, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hello everyone, my name is Jamie McIntyre, Director and Financial Planner at Mac Financial in Geelong. I love being part of the financial planning profession and in particular helping people build and enjoy their wealth. Together with the Ensemble team, we have put together a retirement podcast series to dig into the retirement advice space. I hope you enjoy and pick up some great ideas in today's episode. At Allianz Retire Plus, we believe that all Australians should be able to live their lives with certainty and not have to worry about tomorrow's what-ifs, market volatility, or whether they have enough money for the future. That's why we're committed to delivering innovative retirement income solutions with a guaranteed income for life. We're proud to be part of the Allianz family that's been helping Australians for over 100 years. With Allianz Retire Plus, it all adds up to certainty. Hello to everyone and welcome to episode one of the Retirement Podcast Series. In today's podcast, we are going to talk about helping clients cope with the stress of retirement. My name is Jamie McIntyre and I'm your host of today's podcast. I'm a financial planner and specialize in helping clients plan for retirement and enjoy the retirement that they want. My guest today is Jenny Brown. Jenny is an award-winning financial planner and Beto's most trusted advisor. Jenny is the CEO and founder of JBS Financial Strategists. Jenny established this business in 1992 and over 30 years has built a successful business that is client focused and they love working with pre and post retirees. In our chat today, Jenny and I will discuss the things that cause client stress leading into and during retirement. We will focus on three key themes. Theme one is loss of income certainty for clients. Uh, the second theme is loss of purpose for clients. And the third is having a chat about client emotions during this time and how planners such as Jenny and myself can help them through the retirement transition. Jenny Brown, welcome to today's podcast. Thanks, Jenny. It's great to be here. Let's kick off, Jen. And uh, let's let's start with the income certainty theme and tell me in your experience that you've had with clients over your 30 year journey when working with them, tell me about income certainty and how that matters to clients in pre-retirement. Well, pre-retirement's sort of fairly straightforward where, you know, clients have a, a regular income through businesses that they own and run or through salary and wages. Um, so they're so used to as you'd be well know, uh, receiving a, a regular income that comes in week after week or month after month, however often that they um, they get paid. One of the things that we have found is that it's a matter of then transitioning the clients from getting that regular income stream from salary and wages to understanding when that t- gets turned off, what happens after they stop working. So how do we then leverage the other tap to turn on that ongoing income stream from their investments, whether it be money that they've got um, from the sale of a business, uh, sitting in a family trust, sitting in superannuation. So getting them to understand that it can continue, but how does it actually continue on an ongoing basis? And I think generally speaking, Jen, in pre-retirement, clients have a, a pretty specific focus, not just around their income, certainly because they're going to work, but saving and uh, investing the you know a proportion of that income. Um, and then they shift, as they're shifting into retirement, they've got this fear of, I don't want to touch that money in some ways as well, because they've been so used to saving it. Tell me about, I mean, you experienced that as well, I'm sure. And um, I suppose, how, how do you help clients figure out that it's okay to touch that money? Yeah, it's interesting. We we work with clients in that you know in that that lead up to retirement about what their spending habits are. 
Um, so, and no one likes the word budget. Um, so we tend to try and avoid the word budget. Um, but obviously that's just what it is, but it's, a, it's what their spending habits are. So what do they spend on everyday expenses? What do they spend on discretionary items? What do they spend on, you know, kids and then holidays? And so getting them to understand what that is and then how they can actually then touch that nest egg, which is all the money that they're ever, ever going to have again, as one client once said to us, how do they then understand that, you know what, these investments that are sitting in, let's call it super, generating an income stream that's being reinvested, let's di- divert some of that income stream into their pocket to the, replace the income that they've earned from salary and wages. So it's, it's getting their minds shift around, you know what, we it's just a different source and you're just getting paid a different way. But understanding what you're spending on a regular basis, and I think that's really the key. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Jen. The the most critical part for, for everyone to, well, I don't know if it's the word understand, but have a really clear view on what their intended spending is every 12-month period. And also, I think you highlighted there, things such as holidays and um, and all of those other things, can they give themselves permission to do all of that with this change in income certainly, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and you get, I, I find, and, and I'm sure you do too, opposite ends of the spectrum. You get some clients that are really hesitant to spend any money and they don't and they're very frugal because that's the way they've always worked. And then you get the other end where they just want to spend, spend, spend because all of a sudden they've got all this time on their hands and you're sitting there watching them going, you're going to run out of money if you don't do something about it. So it's finding that balance and trying to then coach the clients that are spending too much that they're going to run out of money and having those tough love conversations, but also then explaining to those who are really frugal, you know what, you can actually spend more than what you are because if you, you know, spend an extra or take an extra 10 grand or 20 grand a year, here's the projection of as to how long your money is going to last. So it's coaching the clients through the different, um, I guess, their mindset and trajectory as to what they think about money. Yeah, I, you, you made comment there of the two, I suppose, two spectrums of those that are underspending um, and you're able to identify that through planning uh, and those that are overspending and, and really have overspent their entire lives. What what sort of techniques would you use or, or types of questions would you utilise for those that are overspending, Jen, um, and are putting themselves at risk of running out of money? So... In the past, when we've had those sort of clients, we've done a series of projections to say, all right, um, if you're spending, I'm going to pluck some figures here, but let's say you're spending, you know, drawing out 120,000 out of your super. If you cut back and drew out 100, this is what it's going to do in terms of, you know, lasting your, you know, your, your, your assets, how long it's going to last. If you then drew out 80,000, so you cut back by forty thousand dollars. This is how much you know longer it's going to last. So, so explaining to clients that by giving a little bit now, you can actually make sure that your nest egg lasts longer than than what it would if you keep spending on the same trajectory. You know, we've got one client at the moment that we have been talking to for oh, four or five years, and he hasn't. He he just can't stop spending every time we meet with him he needs another 10 grand to pay a credit card Uh, and it's it's really sad he was in an awesome financial position when he stopped work well about five six years ago now he's in a terrible position and he's just we keep raising it but it's you know he just hasn't got it um hopefully with our last meeting a couple of months ago um the penny has dropped um, and he did sort of open up and go through a lot of, you know, the emotional trauma that he's been going through. Um, I sat there and listened to him, um, offered some suggestions, and and hopefully, you know, we've got to check in in a couple of months. You know, he will have put some things in place. 
it, in the end, it comes down to the client. You know, you can take a lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. We've been talking to this client for ages about, you know, you don't have to buy that takeaway coffee every day. You know, treat yourself, you know, every second day, you know, just to cut back in that regard. So it's ensuring that clients understand what the benefits of cutting back just a little bit can do in the long term. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I, I agree with your point. You you can't lead the client to, well, you can't follow them around with every action they make every day. And if we did that, uh, financial planning would be extremely expensive. Um, if we were, you know, walking around following clients around all day, trying to stop them from overspending. Um, look, I think you made a, a really interesting comment around that. And that's you use the word emotions, um, and in in context with this client, and clients can self sabotage themselves for many, many different reasons. And and by the sounds of it, Jen, you were able to let's call it dig a lot deeper and and get a deeper understanding in your most recent meeting with this client um, to to get closer to the bottom of it. Is that and what you think, and, and what sort of you put around him to or him or her to? To, to try and break this cycle? Uh, yeah, I think so. So the, the meeting before this one, we'd um, we'd sort of dangled a carrot and said, you know what, if you, you do the, the budget, that dreaded, you know, budget word, if you do a budget and, and really so you understand, because he'd never done a budget and wouldn't, if you do that and understand exactly where your money's going, we'll reduce your fees. And so we offered to reduce juice our fees just by a hundred bucks a, a month, um, hoping that that would give you know a little bit of enticement for him. Um, and you know, in fact, we promised that two meetings ago. He didn't do it last time, um, and he'd been putting off the meeting, putting off the meeting, and then he had done it for this one. He did delay a couple of times, um, but he'd done the budget. So we actually end up cutting the. The fees by two hundred dollars a month as a as an enticement, um, but it was a matter of letting him talk through what was stopping him in terms of doing the budget and also talking to his partner. So he hadn't, well, he's now wife. He hadn't spoken to her about the the dire financial you know stress that they're in because he was embarrassed about it. He was a very successful person when he was working, and when he stopped working, um, he lost a lot of purpose. And I think this was all part of it that, you know, he was um, dating her at the time. And and I think, you know, he just the, he didn't want to cut down on the amount of money that he was spending because I think he wanted to impress. Um, that, that That's my feeling. Um, and he did sort of open up and speak a lot about in, in our last meeting about how it's been really tough for him um, emotionally, um, how he's had to do a lot of soul searching, um, you know, how he knows that he's letting himself down and he's let us down um, and that we've been speaking to him for five or six years about this and he's come to the realisation he needs to do something about it. So there was a whole lot of things we'd put in place, but it was it was all of that side of things, not, not how much your fund's gone up because his fund's doing really well um, thank goodness. But, you know, that that wasn't the, the focus of the meeting. It was very much on him and his emotions and what's stopping him from moving forward and making some serious changes to take control of his finances. Yeah, look, Jen, I've, I've had a similar experience to that when, generally speaking, when you're only working with one of a couple, I know they were building their relationship, so a little bit different to my scenario where the couple were married. Um, you know, often one person's not very good at this stuff to do with money. Um, and potentially for your client, he was, um, I, I suppose it was all glossed over whilst he had a good, strong income and, and successful, uh, work life. And um, I've had a similar experience with us, um, ours was husband and wife and, and the husband took the responsibility of the budgeting because he was the, the big income earner. Um, and Look, in the end, where we've landed now is we've figured out that he's not the strongest one at that, um, and we and it took us quite a while for him to, I suppose, hand over that responsibility to his wife, and we've started to see some really good traction over the last twelve months that they're living within 
they're in their seventies and they're they're living within their means because we're able to demonstrate to them that hey, you're going to run out. Um, so yeah, it's really important I think to get all parties together where you can and and source help. And it sounds like this guy's partner has been a big help for that as well. Hopefully, yes. So we have encouraged him to include her. We'll see how that goes. Absolutely. Look, income certainty is a really, uh, well, well, that transition from that income coming in and being able to save or being able to overspend if you choose whilst you're employed. It's um, And then we go into the retirement phase and which we've just touched on now, which is, um, or well, you can have income certainty in retirement too, Jen. How, how do you, what tools do you have or how do you demonstrate to clients that in retirement you can have income certainty? You've, you've touched on a budget or we call it a spending plan, um, but having a, a, a budget to as your starting point, how do you demonstrate to clients that they, that they can have um, income certainty in retirement all the way through to our technical term we use is their life expectancy. Yeah. So we, I, I guess the first step is to understand how much a client needs to, you know, to live on, so what their, their spending habits are and we've gone through that. Um, but then it's also saying, all right, so if you've got a pot of money, um, how much is that pot earning on a regular basis? And, you know, before we start investing it, for them, um, with them, you know, obviously we use the the rule of thumb, you know, this can earn 4% or whatever it is in terms of, of income. Once we've actually then shown them and demonstrated that we've got these investments in plan for, you know, let's say a couple of years, we can then prove to them that the income being generated from their investments, whether it's being shares or investment properties or cash or whatever it is, this is the actual physical income that's come in from your investments. So by using that physical income, then we can say, well, this is your income certainty that is coming in, which means that we only need to eat into you know X amount of capital or we don't need to eat into X amount of capital if it's more than what they're spending, depending on what their pot of money is. So it's it's explaining and showing them that this is the sources of the income and you've got X amount coming from your shares, X amount coming from, you know, if it's an investment property, X amount coming from cash. Whether or not you spend that money or not, it's still going to come in. And so then by having, you know, a, we always like to have at least two to three years worth of cash cash. And I mean, you know, real physical cash, whether it be, you know, cash at bank or term deposits or something like that for that for their regular pension payments or regular spending you know payments so we like to have that because generally speaking then with the income coming in from the investments we can weather any storm that's going to happen you know if you're then adding in you know regular income you've got three years worth of cash cash plus then the income you've got four to five years you know built up of cash which means that the, we don't have to sell assets in a depressed market, say, you know, through the GFC or beginning of COVID or something like that. So we can show then the clients that we have got this income cert- certainty for you, that you don't have to worry about where your income's coming from. It's sitting here and it's going to continue to go into your everyday spending account so that you know you've got it there. We also explain to clients, you're going to spend more money, generally speaking, in the first 10 to 15, 20 years, depending on how early they retire, versus the latter years. So by then projecting that out and explaining to clients that this is what we're going to project in the early years, and then we'll cut it down a little bit, you know, 15, 20 years into retirement, because you're not going to be spending as much, we can then show them what that will do for their income coming in to to fund their lifestyle. And that's you you often get a, a really pleasant surprise from clients going, Oh, I didn't think about that. Well no, of course I'm not going to be wanting to do the travel through Europe when I'm in my eighties and nineties that I want to do now in my sixties and seventies. So by explaining and coaching the clients about what they want to do 
And when they want to do it, you can then explain, you know, about the, you know, your your assets and your investments and, and how you can live off more now and less later on. Yeah, and then that's a the really important part of um well cash flow modeling and asset modeling to help demonstrate to clients those changes over time. I um I wanted to come back to one thing that you spoke about and Jenny, you and I have had many conversations over the years about different things, including retirement, and we're very aligned in the view that um, having each client, once you've figured out, and let's use for the example, $100,000 is required each year for spending. Um, and then we were talking, or you were talking about the three times that in cash cash. Um, we're the same. We take the same view. I, I just thought I'd add to that, from, um, and you'd probably align with this, Jen, by talking with clients and explaining to them that you always have $300,000 in cash in this example. And next year, you're going to draw down $100,000. And it really doesn't happen, really doesn't matter what the markets do because you've still got two hundred. dollars And by the way, we're going to top that up with your dividends uh, or your rent or, or et cetera. So it's got cash flow coming back in. Um, and then you're able to demonstrate to them with some visuals, which we do. And, and we use the, uh, uh, the Vanguard the the Vanguard one because it shows some great stuff about the dips and we say okay let's look at the GFC yes your you know Oz shares international shares didn't recover for three years now does that really matter to you when you can see the last fifteen years since then what's happened and they're they're really good visuals um, to support what you're talking about there that the the cash cash always needs to be fed and I think that circles what that does is circles back to giving them income certainty in retirement absolutely um and even we we also use the same vanguard charts um and what happened in the the beginning of COVID when you know so many of the companies have their dividends and so by then explaining that you know what this is the regular dividends that were coming in pre-covid this is what happened in the first you know 12 months and then we we can see what happened then after that but just knowing that it's okay because even though the dividends halved, they still came back up if you've got quality assets. So we're of a view that you need quality blue chip assets that you understand what you're investing in, not these weird mezzanine finance with a twist of lemon sort of stuff. You know, That sort of stuff comes unstuck. If you've got quality assets and explaining to clients, you know, you've got quality assets that you know, yes, the companies were being really prudent at the beginning of COVID, but look how their balance sheets were really strong and then they recovered through. So, and the same with the GFC, and we used to the GFC before COVID. You know, it's explaining that and giving, giving clients the story that they can then relate to and understand um, so that they get that confidence that, you know what, it's going to be okay. And that's a great summary, Jen, of a great way to finish most conversations with a client after you've explained some really good things to them and giving them that reassurance of it's going to be okay. And you can kind of see the shoulders drop on the other side of the meeting, can't you? Absolutely. Look, we've had a really good chat about income, certainly. I think we've covered off some great things and throughout the the rest of our podcast, we, we may circle back and cover off income, certainly again. But let's talk about loss of purpose, Jen. So you did touch on that with um, your client, he's overspending. And, and let, look, let's dig into that one a little bit in regards to the loss of purpose. Let's dig into that a little bit more. You, 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 I'll say you glossed over loss of purpose with him because we we're talking about other things. So tell me a little bit more about how he felt about his loss of purpose, let's call it six years ago, when it was changing then. I think at the time he was okay with it. He was burnt out uh, in a very stressful um, executive role for a publicly listed company. So he felt that it was good to have that time out to spend and to regroup. But what he didn't do was he didn't have a structure or a routine for what he was going to do when he wasn't working in that, I'm going to call it nine to five, but it wasn't. It was, you know, long hours and, and high stress. And he didn't have that structural routine. Um, he went from high pressure, I'm burnt out, I've had enough, 
I'm going to slow down and the relationship was new um, with his, as I said, now wife. Um, so it was all very rosy and that's what he was focused on. Versus clients who, the, and the ones we find are successful, are those that have a really good structure or routine when they finish work. So, you know, they've got the volunteer regime, they've got the grandkids, you know, they've got the travel planned or the extra game of golf. You know, they haven't retired to golf or to bowls or to something. They've actually retired and increased what they've been doing. And and if I look at the difference between the client we were talking about, yes, he loved his, you know, he's a passionate um, Melbourne Football Club supporter, um, loves playing tennis, but that was that was it. He didn't have any other structure. So what do you do, you know, during the the week? You know, you've got seven days to fill. Your partner's working two or three. How do you fill the rest of your time and your days? And I think that was part of his his issues that he didn't have a plan. Um, you know, he had a very good plan when he was running this business, but not after he stepped away. So I, I think that making sure that you've got that that plan you know I laughed one day when one of our clients who volunteers for Puffing Billy and he is um he again had a very high paying stressful corporate job when he retired he he loves trains and so he started to volunteer um as a I think a conductor and then he you know got promoted to head conductor and got promoted to station master and all this sort of stuff but he did it because he used his he was using his brain to work out how many people you need to put in a carriage to make sure that you fill all the carriages and that you don't overfill them and don't overcrowd them and stuff like that. So he he had this purpose of of getting out and 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 he, just filling his Wednesdays, you know, as we say, playing with puff. You know, and he was because he was he was running puffing Billy, you know, on the the station. And that gave him, gives him so much joy. You know, he he had a whole his whole week mapped out. You know, Monday was the gym with his wife, and Tuesdays was um, going into the library. I think to because he's, he's an avid book writer, so he's writing a book. Wednesdays, pupping Billy. Thursdays, tennis. Fridays, something else. Saturday and Sunday is grandkids and spending time with his wife. So it was almost like this planned out week. And yes, it had flexibility. But he had a sense of purpose and routine that he knew what he was doing and loved every minute of it. And if he didn't feel like doing something, he didn't have to do it. But just making sure that that he knew what he was doing. Um, we've got another client that that he talks about when he first retired, it's not actually retirement. He was going into phase three. So phase three was his next stage of life. What was that? That's going to be, you know, he's volunteering and they do, you know, a fair share of volunteering, he and his wife, different times so they don't do it together. Um, you know, he's got, um, I think he's bike riding, he's, uh, he's doing a whole lot of stuff. Again, fills his week. But again, sense of purpose. So those clients that, that are really great when it comes, you know, like mentally and have got great lives and, sense of purpose with those that, that have that purpose and that they know what they want to achieve and what they want to do and they have that routine and the structure. But they're not locked into doing something if they don't want to do it. So they're not they don't have to be at, you know, the volunteer place every Monday. Because we've also found that with some clients is they don't want to have to be locked in. They want some flexibility. Yeah, I think there's two key words there, Jen. The first one that summed up, I think, a fair bit of what you spoke about, which ties into purpose, is having a structure. Everyone everyone that we're referencing here are coming from a structured environment of work, a structured environment of, let's call it going home, a structured environment that the grandkids come over on sad days, whatever that may look like. And a part of that structure is your spouse that supports you as well. And then you're, you're shifting into... The work bit gets removed really quickly, and it's about new structures to to find to to have new purposes. And the other word there is flexibility, Jen. I think um, when we talk with clients about retiring, we really talk about being financially free to do the things that you want. Um, so, 
And so, yeah, structure and flexibility are uh, two really important elements for, well, retirees as they're shifting through that phase, aren't they? It is. And I think one of the things that we spend a lot of time with with clients when they are in that, that lead up to, you know, the, the couple of years prior to, all right, you know, knowing that they have the ability that they can pull the pin on full-time paid work at any time that they want to, so they've got that choice, is is explaining to them that there, there's an expectation that the first six months can be quite challenging um, because they're going to go from potentially full-time work, some some might be working four days a week, but potentially most of them go from full-time work to no time work. So it will be challenging doing that transition into the retirement or the phase three, as our client likes to call it. So we talk to them a lot about how other clients have dealt with that um, before it happens. So making sure that they've got that structure and they're going to have periods of elation and and you know the freedom of not having to go and work for somebody else. But they're also going to have periods where they're going to be questioning themselves and they're going to be wanting to you know, have they done the right thing or, you know, how are they going to fill their days um, and what's their purpose in life and what are they going to do in life going forward? So I think it's really important for us as advisors to make sure that we do position that with our clients early on so that they can get their mindset into a, you know, into a, a, a routine of understanding what they're going to do and what they're going to retire to. And I, I think, think that's, that's real. Sorry, Jen, I interrupted Sorry. you. I, and I, I, I do agree with you. It's uh, and it is really important to position uh, with people with clients that there is going to be significant emotional change through this period, and it's okay to have emotional change. I, I think that's a really important thing too: is to make sure they give themselves permission. To go through this change, absolutely, and and it's and it's finding the right things that work for them, and they might try two or three different, half a dozen different things. You know, whether as I said, you know, it's the volunteering or the grandkids or what it is. Um, but you do know you're in trouble when when you're meeting with a client. And they've told you that they've painted the back deck twice in the last six months. That 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 is then like they're filling their days with. Stuff that's you know almost useless, useless. Like you know, they they can't find enough stuff to do, and it, but it's a trigger point that we as advisors need to understand and pick up on. You know, when when you hear a client saying that they painted a deck, and you go back to your finance thinking, hang on, did you tell us you painted the deck last time? We caught up. You know, does it really need? Is it really that bad that it needs to be painted again? I mean, you know, obviously, it's, you know, it's an analogy, but. It is that it is the 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 I guess those triggers that we need to listen for to help our clients and coach them through, um, you know what they're going through. Yeah, I think um, you make a really key point. It's um, it's such a significant time of change, um, and, and let's frame that up as the three or four years leading in, and the, mm-hmm. probably the two years on the other side of retiring. Um, it's such a significant change emotionally that, you know, it, it, it's, you really do need to listen well and, and to be fair, probably dig deep and probe with some pretty deep questions to, to understand what it is they're going through in their words. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's some stats and, and I don't know them off the top of my head. I should have done some research, but there's a large percentage of especially males um, who, when they retire, they have mental health issues, whether it be depression or, um, you know, and there's, there's high levels of suicides and things like that in that first six months after they retire because of lack of purpose. So we need to be really mindful of that as well to, you know, to, but we're not, co- we're not psychologists and stuff like that. I, I, I get it. And um, we can't fix their problems, but we are speaking to them on a regular basis. So we should be able to help um, coach them to seek advice and to seek, you know, making sure that they've got the the networks before they get to that stage of friends 
a lot of people have networks of friends all surrounding the workplace. Well, what happens when you're not going into the workplace every day? Then have you still got that same network of friends when you stop working? So it's making sure that you've got that network of support or the clients have got that network of support people around them so that you know, their friends can pick up you know, when things are going astray and awry as well. I think that's that's key. You know, we've seen a lot of that um, over the years. Yeah, I think. Um, look, we we are not psychologists, but we do. We probably dance around in that space at times, Jen. I, I think we do have a great responsibility to help clients live a great life, and money's a big enabler to that. So we're good at the money side, um, but like as you mentioned there, we do hold a responsibility to ask some really good questions and. And you know, encourage them to find those answers and 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 seek help if required as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, look, I'm, I'm going to just pop back to uh, you talk about statistics, and and you're right, we don't have them with us to reference exactly about potentially males and 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 male depressions and and male suicides as well. Um, look, Jen, what? Why do you think it, it's generally? more males that are having the greater challenges leading into retirement? Um, totally unfounded um, and no st- no supporting evidence or documentation behind this. Ob- ob- observations, Jen. I'm yeah. asking, just asking for observations that you've seen in your experience. You don't have a statistical backup to it, but tell me about your observations. Yeah, I think from my view, it's, it's often because um, the males have, they tend to have the more senior roles um, in a relationship. Females have tended to have more of a relationship with family, um, whether it be their, you know, the, the couple's kids. So let's say, you know, you, you, we're, I'm going to stereotype here, you have mum and dad and, and a couple of kids. So the mum has tended to have more of that relationship with the kids. They've often had more of a, a closer relationship with parents as well. Um, so they've they've had a lot more to do with you know family. I, I think, and from what what I've seen with various clients, is that the mouths tend to be probably more tunnel vision in terms of throwing themselves into work and just getting it done, um, whereas women tend to sort of butterfly over a, a number of different areas. So. That's probably my my gut feel is that it tends to be more because there's not as much of an outside interest and a focus and I'm too busy to be able to go and spend a Sunday playing golf or take off a Wednesday afternoon or a Thursday or whatever it happens to be um, to play golf or bowls or, or something. And stereotyped again, typically the males tend to work a lot longer till they're older, whereas the females tend to stop when they're younger. And I'm saying younger, but they like stop at 60, you know, rather than, you know, 65 or 70 or 70 or whatever it is. Um, they've also had time out if they've got families of the workplace, um, of the workforce to ra- help raise family or to have the kids. And so they've built their networks outside of work as well. So I think that's happened that happens a lot more um in those areas. So that's yeah, just my I guess two cents. Yeah, look that that's a I mean, I, I've um I suppose I've observed similar. That's the era, the genre that's changing now. We've um when I say it's changing, um men and women are both working in pretty high level jobs now and I mean, I have more younger couples um, who, where the female is the higher income earner and the male's doing the supporting role. So I don't think it's really stereotyping. I think it's just more the, uh, let's call it the baby boomer generation. Uh, yeah, you're what probably tra- right. Mm. Is what that traditionally has been. Jen, let's talk about client emotions when it comes to having a nest egg or a big lump of money that they've built to their retirement. And, um, Let's talk about the emotions and how you need to have conversations with them about investing to make sure that they have the capital and the income to see them through their, well, their retirement years. 
Yeah, it's it's interesting. You know, the number of times and the number of conversations that we've had to have with clients who are in their sixties and and um, you know their retirement date is fairly you know imminent, um, and all of a sudden they you know they're they're the great balanced or you know growth investors, seventy thirty split growth to conservative assets to good portfolios, and they want to pull back. And you know, they they want to go more conservative because it's like, well, I'm not going to be adding to this anymore. I'm not going to be making contributions anymore into you know, let's call it their their super nest egg. And and all of a sudden they're saying, well, oh, what if the markets you know tank? What if, what if what if it's always these what ifs? And so it's then working with them and and talking them through that you know what? Yes, there will be some what ifs, and yes we pull out that vanguard chart again you know the market's going to go up and down it's never going to go on a straight trajectory you know upwards you're going to have good years and you're going to have not so good years but that's okay because if you do go more conservative from you know you might go to a 60 40 but if you then pull it all out and and go more cash and flip it around your money's going to get eaten away by inflation and you are going to run out of money. Whereas if you can have a good quality portfolio that's got a really nice mix and you've got the cash cash that we were talking about earlier and you've got those two to three years worth of cash to, to fund your you know retirement income stream and then you've got the rest of your investments to generate the income into that retirement stream, does it matter if we've got a slightly negative year one year and then a good growth year the next? Because we've still got those dividends coming in. So it's explaining to clients that if we keep this portfolio structured the way it is with good quality blue chip assets that you know what they do and you know that you've got regular income strain coming in, then it doesn't really matter if you have one or two negative years because over the longer term, you're going to have you know, good quality returns year after year on average. So it's making sure that they understand that you know, it, it's okay to, you know, to have that portfolio of still growth assets because after all, they're investing for the rest of their lives. You know, every day you're investing for the rest of your life. Generally speaking, if you're retired at 60, you're, you're investing for 30 to 40 years. So you need to make sure that you've got that quality portfolio is going to deliver you the income that you you've got to want and have you know to to do the things that you know you've you've set your goals around. Yeah, and I I, I think something that I'll lean into there, Jen, and this is a, this is around emotions. The mainstream media plies their trade on uh, uh, maybe attacking is not the right word, but getting deep into people's emotions to get a reaction. Um, and that's a big part of their business model. They do great things, mainstream media, but that's one of the significant things that they do. And because of that, a lot of people receive their, if I could say in inverted commas, their financial education from those sources outside of good sources like ourselves, right? So they have an emotional attachment to being, uh, I suppose, having a regular feed from the mainstream media that, that gives them a range of emotions. And coming back to the uh, the chart that demonstrates, what that chart really demonstrates more than anything is volatility uh, when we talk about the return charts. It, it doesn't necessarily demonstrate risk. But however, most clients see that as risk, right? So I think it's really important that I know we do a lot around this. We talk around volatility uh, and, and just change that language from the word risk. Is that sort of something that you do? And uh, I think you'd agree with me. The mainstream media definitely does put their own uh, their own views on markets. Absolutely. Look, we probably don't use the word risk, but we do use the word volatility. And the markets will go up, and the markets will come down, and and that's happened through history. But we also show clients that. You know, it, it does, you know, go up and down, but on the long term, you know, if you do have enough ups and downs, you're still going to have a, and you've got quality assets, you're still going to have an upwards trajectory in terms of 
of the returns and what the markets are doing. So it's it's making sure that the clients can sleep at night, and and that's something that we we use a lot is is that you know we're happy to make changes to clients' portfolios if it will help them sleep at night. You know, if they are uncomfortable being in more of a growth portfolio, that's okay. But you need to understand the the consequences if there are some of being in that type of portfolio. So it's 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 then giving them the education and the the facts and the projections or whatever they need, um, whoever the client is, giving them the information so that they can make an informed decision as to where they're invested. You know, I um I go back to you know we had a had a client once. Oh, I don't know, at least half a dozen years ago, and he was referred to us. He was gung ho. We did the statement of advice. Uh, back then, it was probably a financial plan, but whatever. He was really happy to do the investments. Um, had, was ticking off all these other goals that he was going to do. But when it came to the meeting where we were signing the paperwork to um, to make some rollovers because he had supers all over the place, so we wanted to do some consolidation, he wouldn't make the decision. And he, he sat there in the boardroom, and I, I remember at the time, he, he said, this is all the money I'm ever going to have. I'm not going to be able to to add to this. And, you know, he was like he was stressed out massively because he went, well, what am I going to do? And how's this, this nest egg going to grow? And we tried as much as we could to explain that, well, if you leave it in cash, because it was all sitting in cash at the time, he'd sort of sold it all down because he'd gone conservative. And I think at the time the markets were having a bit of a, a, a dip. If, you, if you're going to leave it in cash, then you're not going to be able to retire um, on the income that you want or your money's going to run out. Take your pick. But if you if you make the changes, then this is where you'll be. He couldn't get his head around the fact that he had that you know he had to put some money into the markets to invest to generate an income. Um, we ended up saying, look, you know what? We're not the right advisors for you. Basically, you're not the right client for us. Um, but you know, we 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 just said we we can't help you. We we just can't help you because you're not prepared to help help yourself. So we had that tough conversation. You're going to get those sort of clients every so often. Fortunately, I think we've only ever had one of them. There are people out there who really shouldn't be managing their own money. They just should have a, you know, a government pension, really, um, because they they can't make the decisions. They're not comfortable making the decisions. Yeah, look, well, possibly uh, 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 some a solution for someone like that too is something of more of, that gives them more of a certain nature. But by the sounds of it. They were reasonably skeptical of, about most things in the world, except the bank account, right, Jane? Yeah, that was about it. Bank account, uh, property. Yeah, and look, we can't ha- we can't help everyone as much as we all want to help every Australian with a good financial plan. I, I mean, I'm not going to connect with everyone I meet with, and 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 yourself as well. So, um, yeah, look, I'm I'm sure that um, client or ex client has, has found the right solution that gives them comfort. I hope so. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, Jen, it's been a pleasure having a good chat with you today throughout this podcast. We, uh, I've, I've really got to hear some nuggets of gold from you um, that I hope the listeners are able to um, well, take something from and, and use in their lives or in, in their practices um, to improve what they're doing. Um, we talked about loss of income certainty that clients experience and we, we spoke about some techniques of of how to give them comfort and that's really about being able to demonstrate to them that they do have enough income in retirement or alternately hey you're sabotaging yourself here you need to cut right back and, and let me demonstrate to you and it's a big I suppose what we're talking about here it's a big education phase through the pre-retirement and retirement um Loss of purpose, I think to sum that up, we spoke about connection, um, making sure you have the right social connections, emotional connections, family connections. To have on the other side of work life um, is really important. And it's okay. Your emotions are going to be there 
pre-retirement and post, then it's okay to work through that transition and it's okay to reach out for help with your financial planner. It's okay to be more engaged with your spouse or your girlfriend in the example that um, you spoke about to get that support you need. So Jen, thank you so much for your contribution today um, and uh, it's been great and looking forward to uh, catching up with you again soon. Thanks, Jamie. It's been an absolute pleasure having a chat and um, yeah, I hope the listeners got something from it. I'm sure they have, Jen. Uh, you have plenty of nuggets in there. Well done. Thank you. Thank you.